From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with Jillian Melcher and Kim Strassel talking about the stunning advances by Ukrainian armed forces in Ukraine and eastern northern Ukraine. And one of the big questions now is, how does Vladimir Putin respond? He spent the weekend celebrating the anniversary of the founding of Moscow, 875th anniversary, criticized for that in some quarters on social media by Russian nationalists for partying while their forces were in retreat. And that's an indication of what the pressure Putin is under here inside Russia. On the one hand, he does not want to mobilize the entire society. Remember, he calls this a special military operation, doesn't even call it a war. If you call it a war or call it an invasion, you get arrested. So calls it a special military operation, which suggests a kind of routine thing, not costly. And if he did go to a draft, a military draft, broad mobilization and conscription, that could begin to turn public opinion against the war. In Russia. On the other hand, you have the nationalists who say, why don't you do more? It's time to get tough. It's time to fight harder. It's time to do some kind of general mobilization. Kim, I mean, I'm not an expert on Russian politics. The ways of the Kremlin are, to put it mildly, opaque. But uh, the choices for Vladimir Putin are not pleasant. Yeah. And, you know, now hindsight is always twenty twenty. but you look at this and you do wonder how he thought this was, I mean, I guess he thought that what he was going to do was roll in there. It would be a victory much as they have done in the past, whether outright Russian troops or operations in which they engage by proxy and call all of this, as you said, a special operation meant to rid Ukraine of its supposedly fascist leaders. Obviously, that didn't work out. Now he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. And it's remarkable if you look inside of Russia, there's been a lot of reporting just the problem he has in terms of the normal TV propagandists that are employed to basically say nice things about the Kremlin. They were all over the place. There was beginning to be criticism of all of this as the news came out because there was no way of denying just how bad the losses had been over the last couple of days. And a lot of people criticizing Putin for the fact that he had said this was going to be effective and brief, that there was going to be, you know, no civilian strikes and that people are getting a lot of information to the contrary. Now, one thing Putin could do, and I still think this might be the most likely response because we've seen them do it before. And because I think he is very fearful of elevating this within the country, given the potential for a public backlash, is maybe they will do what they did when they lost Kiev, which is to say that they were regrouping, or maybe they'll say that they are retreating because they're doing this as a goodwill gesture in order to do nice things for civilians in Ukraine. I think the other risk, though, is that not only does he try to mobilize more of the country behind this, but that he engages in some really underhanded and risky tricks, like, for instance, staging some sort of nuclear event or somehow engaging NATO forces. That would be a huge escalation. And I'm not sure he wants to commit to that yet, but I wouldn't put it past him. Well, yeah. One option, I guess, he could say, all right, let's negotiate here to Zelensky. Okay. He wouldn't concede that Ukraine has made these advances, but he could say, all right, we're going to try to urge a settlement negotiation in which he would hope, that is, Putin would hope that the Europeans, the Americans would pressure Zelensky and the Ukrainians to come to some agreement some ceasefire, perhaps along the lines of the February 24th status quo, perhaps. I'm just speculating here. And you don't know how the Europeans might react to something like that, Jillian, because obviously they're under enormous pressure, too, with the cold winter coming, Putin cutting off much of the gas supply, and maybe in the days ahead, all of the gas supply could be a very tough winter in Germany, in France, in Poland much of Europe if that happens. And we have economic data coming out of Germany in particular and a forecast today 
from a German think tank that uh, they're in recession already there, and that bodes ill for German industry. So Putin could try the negotiation route. On the other hand, he could also escalate general mobilization, figure he can tough it out in the summer. The wild card here, and I think we have to be realistic that this is something Putin could do, would be the use of tactical nuclear weapons or chemical weapons, but tactical nuclear weapons, which... uh, is part of Russian military doctrine, their use. These are battlefield weapons. This isn't Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but nonetheless would cross a line that hasn't been crossed in the world since the initial use of atomic weapons. And it would be an escalation that would take this into uncharted territory. You're absolutely right on that. And I I think this is something that the West and NATO countries need to be paying attention to. I mean, if he were to take a step like that, you would just hope that the West's response would be very, very decisive. This would be setting a terrible precedent. But I I do think it kind of gets to how desperate his circumstances are potentially becoming. I mean, we talk about a general mobilization It's a question how quickly that could actually make a difference for Russia on the battlefield, because mobilizing troops is one thing, getting them trained, addressing the morale issues, addressing some of the inside political dynamics. That's something else. And it's going to be a real challenge for Russia. So I think that Ukraine seizing the initiative means that it can choose the time and place of significant battles. But that, in addition to Putin's poor options, is pushing him into a place where he might make a desperate choice. I mean, he might view this as win in Ukraine or lose power or lose face. And I think it's a particularly dangerous moment. We've known that this would be coming if Ukraine does make gains, but it is really concerning. And he's certainly not somebody that would rule out the potential to do something desperate. And Kim, I think that could put that prospect, the fear of that, could cause the United States and some of the European leaders to tell Zelensky and the Ukrainians, wait, 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 let's not drive the Russians into the Black Sea. Now, again, I don't want to overstate this. This is still only one week of this offensive, and the Ukrainian offensive could stall. There could be real setbacks here. So it's a long way from anything we could describe as Ukrainian victory. But if the Ukrainian offensive would continue, and there is the kind of disarray that we've seen in Russian ranks, then I wonder if Western leaders would say to the Ukrainians, hold it, we need to make sure that Putin isn't so humiliated that he feels he can use tactical nuclear weapons in order to prevent what would be a a total humiliation and defeat and probably the toppling of his presidency. Yes, that is a very real possibility. Right now, if you think about it, Ukraine is in an excellent position given the momentum it's exhibited and given, as we were saying, the vindication of their argument that Western supplies were vital for this to succeed. They're in a great position right now to go back to the West and actually put more pressure even on some countries like Germany, which up to now has not supplied a great great deal of equipment or support, but to really amp up the pressure on a lot of its European allies and say, you need to continue supplying us, you need to get us even more, the same on the United States. But I do worry about this, Paul, because we've seen it in the past. Think back to, well, very early in the war, when they did manage to drive Russia out of Kiev, but it looked as though it was going to be a very long, hard slog. And even then, you were hearing a few reports that the White House was inclined toward just getting Ukraine to cut its losses, allow Russia to keep what it had gained in the east and the south. And Zelensky, to his credit, outright said no. But I think the longer we go on, this becomes more of a possibility that that becomes the Western message, especially too, as Jillian mentioned, because if you begin to get creep closer and closer to the actual Russian border, it becomes a lot trickier to take that ground without actually giving Russia provocation to claim that it has been invaded. So the end game here, if we start to get to an end game, could be far more complicated than everything we've seen up till now. And uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO head, has, I think, if I'm not mistaken, had said that the use of nuclear weapons could trigger our Article 5 of the NATO treaty, which would mean it would be considered an attack on NATO because some of the fallout could implicate NATO countries. And if that happened, the question would become how forceful 
would uh, NATO be required to respond? Some people think that it could trigger that Joe Biden should say to Putin, look, if you do this, this won't be just an attack on Ukraine. This will be an attack on NATO. That means that you will be essentially declaring a war with the United States. All of what that implies, raising the stakes enormously, obviously, and you end up with a situation that we haven't seen since the early 1960s and the Cuban Missile Crisis, potentially. Now, I don't want to raise alarms here, but I just think we have to start thinking about, and I'm sure that there are people in the administration who are thinking about this. The question is, what are they saying to Vladimir Putin about the stakes? All right. Significant events here. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you all for listening. You can email us, our valuable listeners, at pwpodcast at wsj.com. And if you like the show, please do hit that subscribe button. Wall Street Journal subscribers can also join uh, Kim and uh, Carl Rove and yours truly for a live opinion event. Can Republicans retake Congress on Monday, October 17th at 7 p.m.? That will be live in Dallas or streamed online. And for more information, go to wsjplus.com slash opinion live for tickets and more information. And as always, we will be back here tomorrow for another edition of Potomac Watch.